setting the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, to this necessary energy to escape the gravitational field, uh, or get essentially to get to be able to get infinitely far away. I mean, you never escape the gravity. Gravity just gets weaker and weaker. But to be able to make it to infinity, so to speak. G, mass Earth, mass of the object, over radius of the Earth. We can divide off the mass of the object, multiply by 2, take the square root, and we have V equals 2 G, mass of the Earth, over radius of the Earth, root. This quantity is called the escape velocity. And what this means is that if an object were at the surface of the Earth, and had a velocity that was that amount or greater, it would be able to escape out into space. This helps us understand how it is that some um, uh, planets or moons or bodies have uh, atmospheres and some do not. If an object is cold enough that the thermal velocities tend to be less than this, then those, those um, atoms and molecules in the atmosphere cannot gravitationally escape from the object. If thermally the objects have a thermal velocity that's greater than this, then gravity will not be strong enough to hold the atmosphere in and the atmosphere will escape into outer space. Well, there we go. Okay, very interesting. Let's take a look at the energy that an object has in, in an orbit or near another body and see how that affects what kind of an orbit it will have. Sorry, I forgot to put the numbers in for the Earth. If you put in these values, mass, mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth, what you get is the velocity is about 11.2 kilometers per second. So an object would have to move at 11.2 kilometers per second to be able to get away and uh, get into outer space. I mean, once you get far enough and the, and the force gets uh, uh, very, very small, then that's essentially like being at infinity. Um, as far as the gravitational potential energy is concerned. So 11.2 kilometers per second, that is the escape velocity for the Earth. And by putting in other masses and other radii of other bodies, you can determine what the escape velocity is for those. Now, let's go back to what I was saying about, uh, about the orbits. Let's come back to our earlier uh, result that we found. Delta U is equal to U2 minus U1. In other words, we start out at some radius R1 and then we go to some final radius R2 and that is G mass of the object, mass of the earth or let's just say some general object mass M times little mass M so we'll assume that our little object that's moving has a little mass M times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. Now let's imagine that we actually want to send this thing to infinity. So infinity meaning we want to get far enough away from the Earth that we can ignore the Earth's gravity. It's negligible compared to whatever else we're dealing with. So let's let R2 go to infinity. So what does that mean? The change in the potential is then with R2 equal to infinity, it's just G M M over R1, whatever our initial radius is. That means that in order to get something out into outer space, we have to give it enough energy to, to achieve this change in the potential, which is this GMM, GM1, M2 over the initial radius. This is called the binding energy. If the kinetic energy of our object is greater than GMM over R, rather than R1, just whatever the radius is, our initial radius R, wherever our object is starting, if it's on the surface of the Earth or the surface of the planet or whatever. If the kinetic energy of the object is greater than this quantity for whatever the body is, where it is, where, the, where, where this thing is, whatever it is, a rocket or, or whatever, the, uh, part of the atmosphere, if the kinetic energy is greater than this amount, then that object will be able to escape and go off into outer space. But if it's not, if K is less than this, then the object is going to be stuck near this, the, the mass. It will not be able to escape. In other words, it will be bound to the object. 
So the amount of energy that the object has relative to this, the amount of kinetic energy that the object has relative to this quantity, g m m over r, that will determine whether the object is bound to this mass or whether it's free to go out to, uh, to outer space. Okay, very good. This is great. What this tells us is the change in the potential energy as we go from any uh, initial radius r1 to a final radius r2. But what is the potential itself? This is the change in the potential. Can we find some kind of functional form just for u? u equals what? What we want, essentially, is something such that when we add the kinetic plus the potential, we get a constant value. Whoops, constant value. We want a potential that we can use such that the total energy, total mechanical energy, which is the kinetic plus the potential, is a constant during the motion. Well, let's just think about this. If, if the kinetic, which we have a form for, 1 half mv squared, plus some functional form is a constant for, for any, any time during the motion, then we could have k plus u plus some other constant. If this is some other constant, adding in a constant is not going to change the fact that the sum will still be constant. Well, what this does is it, uh, the fact that we can put in this constant is essentially what allows us to choose our origin anywhere we want. We can choose our position so that this quantity is zero anywhere we want and then measure the changes in our potential relative to that point. So where the, what we have to do is determine where do we want to set our potential equal to zero. Where do we want that origin position? Well, we might say, uh, what about at zero? We always think about the origin as where h is zero or y is zero. Let's put that at where r is zero. So we'll set uh, our initial radius, r1, to zero. But what happens if we do that? If we put r1 equal to zero, we get one over zero, and that's undefined. What we end up with is an undefined form for the change in potential. So that doesn't work. Well, what about at the surface of the Earth? We put in r1 is equal to the radius of the Earth. And actually, that's fine. We do that, and that's what we do when we set our ground level at the or our zero level at the ground level, and we measure all the potentials relative to that, at least for the MGH anyways. It turns out that what is actually a little bit easier for us to do in this case is to set our final radius at infinity. What we'll do is we'll set R, uh, uh, R2 at infinity so that R2 is 1 over R2 goes to 1 over infinity or becomes negligible, it's 0. And we get negative, R, uh, negative U1 is GMM over R1, or just we'll just say it's some R, or U equals negative GMM over R. That's okay, that's, that's great. That's a very, very nice simplification. Let's take a quick look at that. Here we go. The potential then at some position R is equal to negative GMM. M, big M is the mass of the object, the planet or whatever we might be talking about. Little m is then the mass of the object that is maybe going out into space over R, the distance from center to center. There we go. That is very nice. But let's keep in mind, what have we defined? We said that the potential then is zero at R goes to infinity, or u at infinity is zero. That's where we've set our zero potential energy. There's only one, there's a little problem here, and that is now that the potentials are always negative, so that no matter where an object is, its potential energy is negative. Well, it's possible then that its total energy could be negative. Well, that's, that's, that's okay, that's all right. The kinetic energy will never be negative. Um, so, uh, it's negative, but let's keep in mind that as R increases, this gets smaller, and so the potential gets less negative. So it's like going from negative 10 to negative 9, negative 8, negative 7. It's still negative, but it's increasing. It's getting less negative, and so the potential is still increasing. 
as we get further away, the potential is increasing, as we hope it would, like near the surface when it's MGH, the higher we go, the higher the potential. Yes, so, <coughs> excuse me, it still does that, it's just negative, it becomes less negative. Okay, very good. Let's take a look at uh, what this looks like uh, uh, as a function of R. So with u equal to g big M little m over r, starting from the planet's surface and going outward, what we have is this 1 over r dependence starting at the surface of the planet, say, called capital R. What if our object, little m, has a total energy, in other words, the sum of the kinetic plus the potential, that's, let's say, up here, call this E1. Well, the object could make it all the way to infinity. It has enough energy that it can escape from the object and go out into outer space. This would be unbounded. What if the energy were right here, right at a total value of zero, so that the kinetic just balanced the potential and the total energy was zero? Well, still, it would be able to make it out to infinity. So as long as E is greater than or equal to zero, the object is unbounded. It can escape into space out to infinity. But if it's something down here, then it cannot make it to any height that's larger than that value of R. Wherever the energy equals this point, the total energy would equal the potential. So what's the kinetic? The kinetic would be zero at that point. So the object can get out to that distance, but then it's going to have to start coming back in to a smaller distance. So in this case, this, uh, to have an energy down here, the object is bounded. So for energies less than zero, the object is bounded to the planet or, or whatever. Okay, very, very good. Uh, one thing that we have assumed so far is that we could always treat the mass as a point mass. We said that uh, Newton's law of gravity was basically from the center of an object to the center of the other object, but what happens if we actually have radii uh, less than the radius of the object? What happens if we go down beneath the surface? What happens to the potential energy in that case? Well, let's just take a quick look at that. <coughs> 